Welcome back to Ox Tools, I'm Tom. So, I think it's time for a meatloaf. What do you guys think? A bunch of people going, yeah, yeah, meatloaf. So, I got a bunch of stuff. Um, as you guys may have guessed, I am working on things behind the scenes. Uh, I haven't posted as many videos as uh, I would like to, um, but quit, I should just not whine and put some more videos out, right? Okay. <laughs> So uh, I got a bunch of cool stuff to show you, uh, some uh, viewer gifts, some tools, and just kind of some shop updates, things I'm working on um, but behind the scenes So uh, for additional video content that, uh, that uh, hopefully you guys will like. Um, so let's check out some of those things and uh, um, see what you think. So what I'm doing now is uh, in the description, I'm just kind of putting um, um, subjects in the description. You know, uh, straight edge, square, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, in the description. So you can kind of scan the description and see what's in the video. Um, and, you know, for future, uh, you can do keyword searches and things like that. So uh, let's see how this works out. And um, I don't know where it's going to fall, uh, you know, as a timestamp on the video. So if one of you uh, industrious uh, viewers wants to, uh, um, add the timestamps for those particular subjects, that'd be pretty awesome. So uh, anyway, let's get to some meatloaf and uh, see what's going on. This is an interesting little problem here. Um, this is one of the kiddos at work. Uh, he asked for a little bit of help um, fixing this head up. Um, I guess this goes to a, uh, a Dodge Colt and uh, he's a Dodge Colt nut and uh, this is a double overhead cam head on supposed to be some hot whammy deal with the star you know collector type thing or whatever but anyway I had a bunch of uh, this is the exhaust manifold so I had a bunch of studs in here that uh, were uh, not cooperating um, so anyway I'm helping him get the uh, get the studs out and you know, you shoot a little bit of video with it too uh, I'm kind of down to the last one uh, there's not a lot to, this is a pretty straightforward job here actually and um, I mean it would be a lot harder if it was uh, in the car let's put it that way so uh, um, so here's what actually happens so th these upper ones um, th they came out really easily they were, there were no problem I just basically unscrewed those these lower ones are a little trickier because they actually project into a cooling passage uh, in the head so when the factory installed these, um, I believe they used some kind of um, sealant or glue or Loctite or something on there to, uh, to uh, keep those from coming out uh, and leaking. Uh, so what happens is they, they twist off when you try to put the Gronk on them. And uh, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. I left one <laughs> for your viewing pleasure. And um, so, you know, if you got a good projection like this, right? Uh, one of your best friends is a is a p decent pair of ice grips with nice sharp teeth that you can bite onto that. And um, there's nothing that you, you know you can grab onto that with that's any better than this. Um, but as you'll see, what's going to happen here is the uh, the stud will actually fail in torsion um, because it's not coming out. <laughs> So that's what's happening, and you gotta get it nice and tight. So, so what I'm doing is alternating uh, the direction and just trying to wiggle the thing loose. Okay, and I can see this end's turning, and I'm looking through the crack here, and the other end's not turning. So it's actually gonna do what I want it to do. Well, for the video anyway. Um, and shear off there. So, <laughs> so now what, right? Well, once again, if it, if it failed in torsion for the full diameter like that, no easy out is, is going to be able to hold on the, on the inside of that. So drilling is really the only practical solution. So I created a little, uh, a little drill fixture that fits on here. And it's counterboard for this uh, the bit of stud that uh, uh, was snapping off here. And what it does is it helps line that up. And then I just pick up this other hole here. Actually, did these have okay? No, this one's okay. Put that on. All right, let me get that on there. And then I'll bring it in a little closer, and we'll drill that sucker up. All right, let's create. 
that down. So I measured the uh, the center to center distance on those studs carefully, and uh, and then drilled this on the mill so that uh, the centers are are good. Okay. Okay. So what we're doing is we're just going straight in with a with the uh, the tap drill size for this. This is a uh, uh, this is M8, okay, and uh, so Bob's your uncle. Fortunately, these are these studs are uh, not the super high strength like turbo studs, so uh, they're pretty soft. Back in a minute, and uh, I'll drill through. I think that's the end of it. Okay, I think that's the uh, end of the line for that stud. Let's take this off, get a look at it. Okay, so yeah, let's take a look at that because you can see uh, um, how well that the fixture centered that up. Yeah, so see that drill fixture? It just shot right down the center of that. And that's, that's actually key for uh, removing a fastener like that is uh, getting your, uh, you know, your drill uh, on center. Now, what we want to do is, so we want to kind of collapse this little bit right here, which is pretty easy. It'll come, it'll actually break right off pretty easily here, like that. Okay. And then if we're really lucky, Oh, no, not so lucky. So sometimes the, um, you know, you can kind of unwind it out of there like a helicoil. Uh, any remaining, uh, any remaining thread stuff that's in there. Okay, that looks pretty good. So uh, we're gonna run a tap through that. Um, I'm gonna, f I'm gonna flatten that surface. There's a little bit of a built-up edge there um, that I'll flatten out, and then uh, we'll run the tap through there. to make my life easier. Make sure that's in there. So these are these big gator drill guides. They're actually really nice. Um, they got a little uh, V in the bottom and everything uh, for going on round stock and whatnot. Um, but these just kind of force you to do a good job, right? It gets me started nice and straight and in the right place and the tap can behave itself. Probably a piece of uh, uh, the stud still left was loose in there and jamming. All right, I think we got it. Felt oh, like it went all the way through. Oh yeah, there's a little port over here that's got some kind of nasty-looking sealant on it. Uh, I bet you that's the same stuff they use in the studs. Okay. 
blow that out and uh, I think I'm gonna I'll go back I don't know if you guys can see it but I filed it a little bit there's a raised area around this you know when they cranked the studs in originally you know it displaced a little bit of material upwards so um, you know the machinist uh, not hitting me uh, doesn't like that so maybe we'll uh, go back and flatten those off but anyway uh, I think we're done with this uh, looks like it's uh, recovered well and uh, anyway thanks for watching guys all right this comes all the way from England uh, from a gentleman named uh, Alan Barker and uh, it's a it's a level and uh, <laughs> And you know, guys, you guys know that I have a uh, kind of a level fetish, um, and who doesn't like a a, a bakelite bakelite box with uh, with chrome latches, right? Oops, wrong level. Actually, this is a another one of my Hilger levels. I did this on purpose, just so you guys know. The real one is that came from Allen is in a very similar box. As you can see here, let's uh, spread these out a little bit so you guys can see. And uh, these boxes are just magical. Uh, they have a wonderful smell to them and they're just, uh, you know, totally built by engineers. So let's take a look at this one here. This is the one Alan sent. And it's a block level. I don't have one like this. Actually, let's get this one out of the way here. Um, and this is a... Uh, 12 inch uh, block level made by Hilger Watts and it's older so it says Watts London and uh, they um, they changed their logo a little bit and I'm not quite sure on the uh, the time period when they when they when they did that um, and this particular one came from let's see I wrote it down over here the Richard Garrett engineering works in Dereham Dereham uh, Norfolk um, so I guess they, they built steam engines or uh, some kind of steam powered uh, or boilers or th something like that. It's not clear what they, uh, what they made. This one has a V-groove uh, underneath it and then a flat surface. And look at this. Th these are the nice details I like about uh, Hilger, right? There's the adjustment tool and this appears to be the original one. Little, little tabs to hold it. And then the, this is pretty dirty here. I cleaned it a little bit and uh, as best I could, but they lined the inside of their boxes with suede um, to protect the the level. And you know, it still has a little bit of uh, of leather scent to it, and um, uh, to protect the bottom of the level. Now this one's a little different here. It's it's adjustable. You can adjust the vial a little bit and then actually read. Uh, an angular um, uh, displacement too with that. That's kind of a, a, neat, a neat feature. But Paul, think, or excuse me, uh, Alan, where did I get the, where did I get Paul? I don't know, sorry. Um, oh, there it is, Dere, Dereham, right? So, is there any other marks on this? Uh, not that I see it. So I did a little bit of cleaning on this. Um, I may uh, resurface the bottom and or lap the bottom. And, uh, and then calibrate it, uh, but it's a, just a beautiful level. And um, Alan, thank you so much for sending this, and uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, he went to some expense to send it to me, and uh, I certainly appreciate that. Um, and it goes, it's in, it's in good company. So, uh, um, do I have another one? I don't know if I have another one, I, I'm not sure. Uh, another Hilger level anyway, but I have some other levels, as you guys well know. So anyway, 12-inch uh, block level. This one's good for uh, five ten thousandths of an inch per foot or 0 0.05 millimeters per meter, okay? So this is great for setting up machinery, things like that. And if you guys don't have one, you should, everybody should invest in a, in a decent level. And there's some kind of offshore ones that are actually pretty good. Um, some guys have uh, resurfaced the bottoms and then uh, made good use of them. Um, if you can't afford a, uh, um, you know, a kind of a name brand one, but there's a lot you can do with levels. You can align machinery, and if you have a straight edge, you can do some some other kind of interesting things with uh, with levels. So, every all machinists uh, should have a decent level in their uh, in their inventory somewhere. So at least one. All right. So Alan, thanks again, and uh, let's move on to the next thing. Okay, this one is. Um, 
you know, some of you guys that, uh, that follow me on Instagram, uh, I, I put up a, a little uh, post about this, uh, this parallel um, or straight edge. You can kind of take this one two ways. Um, a friend of mine named Mark, he, uh, he brought this to me and uh, he said, oh, hey, you know, uh, with your new fancy pants, uh, brown and sharp surface grinder, uh, can you grind this for me and uh, get it straighter? And uh, I said, well, how straight do you want it? And he, he wasn't very particular about it. This one is um, about 20 and a quarter inches, uh, 515 millimeters, um, this particular one. And, and it's, what are we, uh, so it's about three inches tall or, uh, you know, 75 millimeters or whatever uh, tall this way. Um, now, what's interesting about this one is um, it's made out of a piece of structural I-beam here. So let's take a look at the end there. You guys can kind of see that. That I think, you know, somebody found a piece of uh, small I-beam. In fact, you can see the some of the rolling marks uh, that they print on the side here. Let's see if you can see it on that side. No, you can't. Um, anyway, uh, and then they cut the, uh, the flanges down and, uh, and made kind of a straight edge out of it. And they machined it and then um, it wasn't scraped or, I don't even think it was ground actually, I'm not sure. It was kind of beat up when, I, when, I, when he brought it over. But he was out a few thousandths and he wanted it better if I could do it better, right? And I said, mm, boy, that is like right at the extremes of my travel on my machine, right? So anyway, it sat around for a couple of months and then, um, you know, I fired up the, I've been, I've been doing a little grinding on the, um, the brown and sharp and I said, well, let's give this thing a go and see how it goes, right? See how, it, give it a go and see how it goes. Okay, that's a lot of, a lot of goes there. Um, anyway. It ground pretty well. Uh, it's soft. I think I mentioned that. And um, uh, so you get your wheel selection is important uh, when doing that. But because it's kind of at the extremes of travel, you know, you got a lot of table hanging off on either side, right? So if there's any slop in your table or whatever, it, it shows up in your part. And um, and that's one of the reasons that grinding your chuck is one of the most difficult things that you you can do on the surface grinder. Well, this hangs out. A little bit over the chuck, so it's kind of even worse at some at some level. So I got it pretty close. Uh, I was within um, I don't know, it was about six tenths or something like that, or five tenths. Um, one end had a little a little wowser uh, popping up, but I started screwing around with it and like, well, how good can I get this? Because I've seen some videos on 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 localized lapping, and um, um, if you're measuring capabilities are decent then you can basically and you have a good surface plate you can uh, you can kind of chase these things out and actually do a pretty good job right so I've been working on it let's just put it that way um, and you see some little marks here these are my uh, my support areas here how you support this while you're measuring it has to be super repeatable and that's what these marks are about and we'll see that in a sec when we go into the metrology room well, here's the side I've been working on and um, it's getting pretty good. So right now it's uh, between 50 and 75 millionths uh, from end to end and side to side. Um, so we're looking pretty good. And uh, now I do wanna kinda take it a little farther. My target is around 50 millionths everywhere and uh, parallelism and straightness and all that stuff. So uh, that's kinda my target. Um, and. Frankly, it hasn't really taken that long. Uh, some, you know, somebody uh, on Instagram, oh, I got a little dingus McGee there, what's going on? Huh. Maybe there's something on the table. Um, somebody asked how long that takes, right? Well, the actual lapping doesn't take very long, but you gotta take breaks because you're touching it with your hands and things are warming up and, and doing weird stuff. So you gotta be confident in your metrology that uh, they're actually measuring what's there. So, you know, it has to soak out and sit for a little while. So I'll do some lapping and then I'll check it and then, um, and then I'll let it sit for a while and I'll check it again and, uh, and, until I'm confident that it's reached kind of equilibrium, right? And, uh, and then go back. You know, if I heat this in the middle here, this gets longer than it does this, right? So let's go, uh, let's go take, God dang it, that's bugging me. Well, that's, you know, this is one problem with having something that's soft, right? If it touches, 
a piece of grit or something else, uh, it can get a little mark in it. But uh, I got a couple of little annoying little dings in there. I've been doing some other stuff in that room, so maybe something rolled into it. I don't know. All right, let's go look at the uh, the measuring setup, and then I'll show you the lapping setup that I've been using to uh, locally lap this. Okay, so here's the here's the measuring setup, and uh, so what I want to point out here is those marks that I showed you earlier. Those are uh, it's like point five five three six um, of the length, the overall length of this. They're pretty close to what's called the uh, bessel points, but not quite. It's it's just subtly different. This is the uh, minimum sag uh, kind of position, and I've got it set up on uh, on two gauge pins here, um, and that's the actual contact point between the the surface plate and the uh, and the and the, the straight edge. So so the general idea is, I don't really know what the condition of the other side is, right? Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure it's pretty good because I, I checked it before, right? And almost doesn't matter as long as I put these back in the same place. Um, hence the uh, the marks um, um, on the on the straight edge, or, or excuse me, on the parallel. Um, so I put a bit in that repeats, that repeats, right? So what I'm doing is now I'm comparing this top surface to the surface plate, which this is a double A. Uh, laboratory uh, grade surface plate, okay, which is you know good to 20 millionths or whatever it is, and um, so now I can traverse across here um, with an indicator and I can kind of map the surface, right? So as I'm going along, uh, I'm noting the uh, the indicator readings up or down, and this guides my lapping process, okay? So uh, you know I might mark, yeah. You, you can mark it any way you want just so you know what you're doing, right? Um, and the idea is that you can remove this and put it back on there and get the same readings and again and again, right? That's kind of what you have to be able to do. So if you can get to that, then you can actually create this very, very, very straight uh, thing. And now I can turn this over and make this parallel to that and flat to that so by definition I have a really good parallel now right you can also mic it uh, but when you get down to uh, you know below a tenth or whatever miking uh, gets a little tricky uh, to get uh, real reliable reading so, uh, so anyway, that's kind of the measuring setup and then uh, you know I'll, I'll zero it at one end like this and then I'll traverse along and then I'll, I'll check it in different place you know, in, in increments like this across to make sure that um, um, straight this way, it's, or excuse me, uh, um, flat this way and flat that way, right? Or parallel to the surface plate. Okay. And then I, you know, I just mark it with a Sharpie and then I take this over to the lapping bench, which I, I don't do any lapping in here. Uh, this is all my fancy pants measuring stuff in here, but uh, we'll go look at the laps I made. Um, and this is peculiar because it's soft. And, um, and it didn't even click to me. Robin uh, Renzetti and I were talking, and uh, he goes, "Yeah, you should use an aluminum lap on that, not a cast iron lap." And I went, "Duh." So anyway, I made an aluminum lap, and everything's uh, the world is happy again. <laughs> I I completely forgot the. Uh, uh, that this was soft, right? You know, when you're working on it, right? Uh, it's not like you uh, you're scraping it with your fingernail, right? So let's go look at the lapping thing. All right, so here's the lapping setup here. So what I'm using is I'm using a 12 micron diamond and uh, with a little bit of uh, Kingsford uh, charcoal light lighter fluid uh, as a lubricant and a carrier uh, to keep the, uh, the swarf kind of out of my way. Um, I'm also using this stuff. Uh, this was sent to me as a sample from Kemet and uh, they sent me a, uh, a couple of things that I'm going to show you here in a minute. but. Uh, this is their lubricating fluid and it's excellent. And um, um, I thought I had found uh, kind of the, uh, the cat's meow here in this Kingsford solvent. What you're looking for is something that doesn't evaporate very fast, is persistent and, um, um, and is light enough to float the particles out of your way and kind of stay there and, uh, and, uh, and not be a, a nuisance. Well, theirs is similar in consistency, but it's actually um, um, 
I want to say it has some kind of surfactant in it or something like that. At least that's what it feels like. Um, and um, um, the effort uh, when I use this is is much lower. And uh, you know, these are all pretty. You know, we're not talking about major effort here, but uh, um, it's noticeable between these two. And, uh, and you can see I've been kind of drinking the Kool-Aid here, so to speak, and uh, and using it up. And uh, <laughs> They sent me a uh, lapping plate and uh, some other stuff to try here, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Anyway, let's get back to this. So I'm using 12 micron diamond, and then here's my laps, okay? This is the first one I made. This is cast iron, and I surface grounded and then, uh, and then grooved it. And um, anyway, immediately I was getting crappy results, and I was like, geez, what's going on? And uh, Robin happened to call me about something else, and. Uh, and I mentioned it to him and he goes, well, is it soft or hard? And I go, I go, what? And he goes, the parallel. And I said, oh, it's, uh, it's soft. He goes, well, you should use an aluminum lap. And he's absolutely right. And I, I totally gelled and forgot. Uh, the lap needs to be softer than the target material. And this is the target material here, right? So if this was hardened steel, this would be fine, right? Uh, but it's not, it's soft. So the lap needs to be softer, softer so that the diamond sticks in this and then uh, you're not, you know, have a free abrasive process. So, uh, so anyway, I made this lap and I spent a bunch of time screwing around with it to make it nice and it works great. Um, but then as I kind of work my way down and I'm getting into these, into smaller areas with, with areas that were already really close, right? I needed a smaller one. So uh, being the lazy guy that I am, I just went over to the bandsaw and lopped a, lopped a chunk off and uh, made a smaller lap that I can uh, actually apply to a very small area. And that's what I meant by kind of targeted lapping, right? Is if you map this really well, right, you're gonna end up with, uh, with, with things that look like this, right? And uh, where this is the area that you, that you wanna work here, right? But you really wanna stay off of, a, you wanna stay off of the surrounding area, right? So you end up with, some smaller laps to uh, to kind of work those areas, and then those get blended out. Now you know this all sounds very weird and esoteric, right? But uh, if your measuring is good, you can create an incredibly uh, straight and uh, flat object. So uh, so anyway, that's uh, the the marks mark straight edge uh, work that I'm fiddling around with, and you know a lot of this is just learning for me too, uh, practice and learning for me because I'm just kind of interested in these things. So. Uh, but uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the Kemet stuff that came in uh, in uh, a little bit, and uh, and see what we can uh, learn about that. All right, here's the <clears throat> this is the lapping plate that uh, Kemet sent me. Uh, these guys here that they sent me to test. So they sent me some um, this lubricating fluid, uh, some three micron diamond stick, which is kind of interesting, and then one of their XP plates. Now, I was interested in trying one of these because this particular type of lapping plate, it's, um, it's a copper matrix, so it's kind of a, I would call it a proprietary, proprietary uh, um, material that these guys have developed. And it has a, actually a fairly wide range of materials that it can, um, um, that it can be used to lap or that can be lapped on it, I should say. So uh, this would be more towards the softer end of the spectrum a little bit, although this does extend up and will work on, uh, on some harder things too. So, uh, and you can see how they, how they make these. It's this copper matrix material here, um, and then an aluminum backer, and then a the, uh, nice feature that they do is they put this uh, kind of non-skid uh, rubber pad on the back. Now, my only observation here is that uh, for the diameter of the plate, this seems a little bit thin uh, compared to other makers and whatnot, but uh, um, I don't know what the modulus of, of elasticity of this is, so maybe it's uh, stiffer than uh, the aluminum, so I don't know. Um, but they, they get good results, so you know, maybe I'm just being a ninny too. So. But anyway, I just noticed that it's a little thinner. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is the diamond. It's kind of like a deodorant uh, dispenser. You, you crank this and then uh, it's, a, it's kind of a, um, well, it's kind of like deodorant, but it's got diamond in it and uh, not recommended uh, <laughs> for daily use. 
But what's nice about this is it's the diamond distribution in this in this carrier, this waxy carrier, um, is uniform throughout. Where if you have a, uh, I don't have one here, but if you have a liquid suspension, uh, generally it falls out of suspension and you have to continually stir it. So this is really nice for that. So I got a little sample piece here. This is a this is actually soft steel, um, and it's it's just been. Um, um, done on the surface plate on a little bit of abrasive paper okay so we're gonna we'll lap the end of that a little bit just as a quick demo here and uh, so with the three micron so here you can just pop some on there okay and that's uh, that should be plenty um, for what we're doing here and then we're gonna use some of their uh, their lubricating um, uh, magic sauce there okay and then pick up a little bit of the diamond here make sure it's in between and then distribute it okay and now I'll so now I'm concentrating and holding it flat against the plate with uniform pressure and I'm using a, a circular motion here you know, a lot of guys are probably out there screaming, do the figure eight, figure eight. And my experience with the, the figure eight is um, um, it's hard to focus on keeping the, the, the part in contact with uniform pressure when you're changing directions with the, with the figure eight. So you're better off with a, a, a linear pattern okay something that you can maintain this um, you know um, the the pressure and the con the proper contact okay or something like this a circular motion and you're trying to use all parts of the plate not favor uh, any particular spot all right let's let's have a look at this and see what it looks like Oh yeah, it's coming up nicely. And all that black stuff is uh, the uh, the love that's coming off of there. So the diamond love. Okay. So actually, this is reflective enough that we could go uh, throw this under the mono light and uh, and see what we've got here. Let's uh, give it a little rinsey. Yeah, sure, why not? So, like I said, that was, and you can see it's, it hasn't cleaned up all the way out to the edges so that you would keep going. So I probably wouldn't start with three micron on that. Uh, I'd probably start with something like 12 and then six, three, and then uh, depending what I wanted to do from there, you know, one or something like that maybe. So let me, uh, let me clean this up and let's, uh, we'll run over to the mono light and throw that on there and see what we did in that, I don't know, what was it, a minute? Minute and a half, something like that. Okay. All right. So we're under the under the mono light here. I'm just going to give this a little quick wipe and then the dust off here. Okay. And uh, I got my optical flat here. Okay. Do a little dual optical flat. This is a square one here, which is kind of interesting. Exclude dust. Okay. All right. They got the fringes. Let's see. Can you guys see those? Look at the viewfinder here. All right. Well, let's see. I'm having a hard time seeing in the viewfinder. All right, well, so if I eyeball this, so it's it's rolling off of the edges, but the, the main part is, I'm going to call that one light band or something in the main part, and then it rolls off of the edges there, um, which is about 11 millionths flatness across uh, um, the, the bulk of the area there. Now, we've we got some funny business going on on this edge over here. Um, 
so what was that you know two minutes of uh of lapping uh while i'm yapping on the f uh, to the video so uh that's uh this shows you you know how quickly some of that stuff goes once you uh once you get going on it so let me okay now you can now i can see them in the viewfinder i, I won't know until i sh i that other video segment if i'll be able to see them um until i start working on the video um but anyway, that's the, uh, there's some fringes, okay? And we're looking at the bow of the fringes, that curvature. So if you use a straight edge in relation to it, um, you can interpret the, uh, the flatness of that, okay? All right, so, all right. So anyway, Kemet lapping uh, plate and uh, compound. Um, thank you very much for sending that out. And um, uh, works really good. Uh, this is, like I said, this is soft steel. I work great on that, so. Alright, All right, some eagle-eyed viewers might have spotted this in the background of the, that last segment with the, uh, the lapping. <clears throat> what I'm doing over here, once again, this is just kind of, some of this is shop updates, you know, stuff that I'm playing around with this to, uh, uh, this of interest to you guys. Now, a lot of these are kind of experimental things and I don't necessarily uh, videotape them, but uh, the um, you know, once it starts kind of going in a direction I, I'm, I'm liking, uh, and I feel like I'm understanding it uh, more fully, then I, I share the stuff with you. So what we got here is, this is just a plain Jane kind of coal rolled steel here, okay? And um, the idea behind this exercise here is, you guys have all heard of the, uh, the three plate method of uh, generating a flat plane, right? Where you scrape one, match the other one to that, or match the two others to that, and then you, you alternate them and, and match them all together. And by default, you end up with a flat plane, okay? Um, so you can't do that with two, um, but you can do that with three. And the same thing, that same principle, that idea that um, matching, um, matching surfaces um, also works for straight edges, okay? So you can create a straight edge, uh, th or three straight edges, um, that match perfectly and that are perfectly straight and, uh, and, uh, and flat, okay? So just think of them as tiny, tiny flat planes, right? Okay, is I think the right way to think about it. So I started fooling around with it, and like I said, this is this coal rolled, nothing, uh, nothing fancy here. Um, and I've labeled them A, B, A, B, uh, you know, E, F, C, D, whatever, um, uh, to keep track of the edges. Um, so I'm only doing three edges right now um, and matching them. So the first step is uh, to kind of pick one that's uh, the best one. And uh, none of these were particularly good. So what I decided to do was use a, a straight edge that I already have. Um, and get one of them, you know, pretty close and then start working the other two to that and then just speed the process up a little bit. Um, it's not necessary to have this. In fact, uh, technically you don't need any measuring tools uh, to do this, which is the part that really interests me, okay? So what we're doing here is, um, um, you know, we're basically, it's kind of like scraping, right? We would, uh, we, we would use some ink, right, and uh, and spot this edge, and then we take a look at it. And these two actually have some spotting on them, and you can see here, okay, the indicators. So what we would do is go over to the uh, go over to the vise, and you know, with a file, we would draw a file that, draw a file that, and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat until we get um, a nice uh, matching surface. Now. You can do some pretty incredible work with just a hand file if you have a way to track your your results, and this is how you would track your results, right? And uh, and match things up. So more on this later. It's just something I'm playing around with. Uh, the intent. So tech, you could create a straight edge that was six or eight feet long if you wanted to. Okay, that's the exciting part for me is I don't have a surface plate that long and measuring stuff that long is kind of a pain, right? But if I had 
three pieces of flat bar that were that long, I could match them together uh, in alternating patterns and end up with uh, three really nice straight edges that were six or eight feet long, okay? So that's the part that's exciting with me. I don't have to have a, a reference like this uh, to do that work. So that's the kind of exciting part for me. And um, for those of you that are, are probably wondering, this is this uh, water soluble um, uh, etch aqua wash. Um, it's used for uh, printmakers and stuff. And it's Prussian blue. And you can see it's a very, very dark blue, uh, but it washes off with water. Uh, soap and water where uh, the um, Dicum or Permatex is uh, kind of oil based and it's a pain in the neck so all right well <clears throat> while I was doing uh, Project Egress I, I, I had to use my arbor press for uh, broaching something on that and uh, I I was not in a very good mood at the time when I was had to do the broaching so I got really annoyed at the uh, at this arbor press you're okay now so relax um, this is a Famco, um, and um, I th it was basically brand new, but there was some dry cosmoline and stuff on the RAM that uh, uh, there were still remnants of it that I had, hadn't taken this apart fully to, and to scrape that off and clean it, right? So it was, kind of, it was kind of bothering me, and then the end of the RAM was not flat, so I just kind of stopped and I just took care of this thing, okay? so. Uh, um, so I flattened the end of the ram, and I'm going to show you some improvements that I made to this that are, that are noteworthy, okay? Um, so uh, if you have an arbor press that's similar, this transforms your arbor press. So the first thing you'll notice is this brass uh, dealy popper down here, and we'll talk about this handle in a second here. So this is an attachment. Um, or you might think of it as an appliance attachment. So what that means is you can put whatever you want in there, right? So it's just drilled and tapped and it's got a little pilot that's, that's accurate. So now you can um, put something in there. Now this is just a modified shoulder bolt, right? Um, you can put something in there like that if you got to go down a hole and uh, do something, okay? Um, or um, make your own, you know, fixed pilot punches, uh, uh, whatever you want, right? And um, or when this gets all chowdered up, or you want a really dead nuts smooth surface, you just run over to the lathe and face that off, and you got just you know as good as it can be, right? So uh, anyway, that's a, a nice. Oops, I'll get back in there. Some machinist made that it fits too tight um, and that just screws in there and the you know the load doesn't go through the screw it goes you know through the flat into that so the other thing is this handle okay so until you've tried this you won't understand how good this is right I um, used an arbor press many many years ago it was made by Dumont the guys that make brooches and it had and somebody had just monkey rigged a, uh, a, a little side handle to the thing. But I'll tell you what, that was the best arbor press that I ever used. It, it had a round ram and um, um, we had done this to it and, uh, and it had this little side handle and half the time you could do your pressing with the side handle, right? And um, I'm up on the other side here. But I don't, if you think about how you use this, so if this isn't here, you're, you're doing this, right? And it's just not an optimal purchase um, around the rim of this, right? So now you got the side handle here, you got a little, so I increase the radius, you got a little more leverage, so you can, you can go up and down real quick, get position, and then use the main lever, uh, you know, to, to, to put the beans to it, right? So uh, I just cut a notch in the side of this, and uh, this is a, uh, it's a rotating handle uh, on a steel uh, steel bracket there. So if you have if you don't have that on your uh, on your arbor press, I highly recommend it because it really transforms it and gives you a place to hang your hat too when you're done. So uh, that's something I did recently that uh, I thought I'd share with you is the uh, the nose modification and the handle and uh, Bob's your uncle.